that right. Cool. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I think uh, first announcement is we had a conflict today. We're going to move this meeting to the 11 o'clock. Uh, let me see. I guess it's 1 o'clock Eastern time going forward. Um, so that way the protocol team can join us as well. Uh, so not next week, but the week after that. It'll be later, and I'll make sure that all of the calendars and dates are set up. So that way they're they're on um, on the right time zone. So appreciate your patience today. Um, it's going to be a little bit backwards with our agenda. So instead of having Shane jump in first, I'm going to go through some grant stuff, and then we can uh, pass it back to Shane, hopefully with plenty of time to, to go through everything that they have. All right. So... Bear with me as I blitz through some of these to go backwards. That's a preview, everybody. Not everybody gets those. Ooh. I can't believe you're leaking all my juicy info. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, sorry. It's the only way to do it and share a screen at the same time. So, um, Great. So I just want to do some reminders to kick us off here. So. Uh, we do have bounties going, and we've actually had a couple people complete bounties. Um, really want to encourage everybody here to think about bounties in two ways, right? There are things you can step in and do for open bounties that you need. And then also, this is your DAO. So if there are bounties that you think are valuable or things that you would like the community to take on, um, we used to have a program called Ideas. We haven't con we haven't brought that back, but we are, we are trying to figure out if um, there's a way of, you know, should any DAO member be able to create a bounty? Um, obviously, places like Grove and Nodis and the gateways that are doing a lot of work, if they have small things that need to be done, we can put them out to the community. But I would just love for anybody who has ideas to post into that bounties channel and let us know that, hey, I'd love to create a bounty for this. And again, um, the token price is doing well. It's your community. If work's going to be valuable, let's find ways to get community members paid for, for staying engaged. So... And um, you can just type hashtag bounties and that channel should be open to everybody. And we have talked a little bit about governance um, or a lot about governance in the last week. And so once we once we decide on the new method of governance, we think that um, we think that the way we want to do it is that you can complete a bounty even if you're not part of the community. But in order to get paid, you're going to have to be a citizen. So we're not quite sure on what that mechanism is yet, but very open to feedback on if bounties should be open to people outside of the DAO. Um, in the current state, where there's only 70 people that are active voters, we think it makes sense for them to be open to everybody. But, you know, we're always open to changing ideas. So get your bounties, get paid. Shout out to uh, the people that have already completed one. Super excited to have people jump in and get those done. It's been really helpful. The big thing to update for today, um, and I'm going to have a, a forum write up on this uh, tomorrow, but anybody who's currently getting a grant, the way that the current process is, you go into the forum and you post like, hey, this is what I've done over the last month. Here's how I'm writing impact. The, the short version is that it's just a little bit uh, unclear from the side of the person who's receiving the grant, like what we're looking for. And so what we want to do is we really want to make that more clear and say like, hey, here's the five ways that you're being measured on your grant. Here's how we're evaluating the impact. And here are the things that you want to report on. Um, and I'm going to caveat all of this with saying like, this is an experiment for us to see if this process is going to work good for us. I think on my end, I'm really excited because it gives people clear goals for how they continue to keep their grants open. And then um, starting with March, we're gonna have a zero knowledge way so that way everybody can review other people's grants. And so I'll know that you've done your job, which is, hey, you've reviewed the other grants, but I'll never know which grants you've reviewed. So this gives the community a way to um, voice if we think that things are impactful and a good use of DAO funds without kind of doxing yourself in any way. I know Shane, you had originally said it, it doesn't make sense at these low amounts to review somebody and jeopardize your own socket by making it political. And I totally agree. So um, I'm hoping this will be a solution where we can get more people voting uh, and weighing in on this. And then the real big picture here is um, we're going to do a retro funding round. And the impact that people are doing from the, the grants that we've given out um, are going to be a really good way for us to be able to measure like, hey, these are the people that are doing multiple ones. This is the impact that they've delivered on. It should just make it an easier process on both the grantee side 
and on the foundation side for making sure that the right people are getting um, funded for the work that they've done, right? Again, based on impact and not based on anything else. So I'm going to jump into a little demo. Does anybody have any questions before I do that? Great. Okay, so I'm going to just jump into a little demo here. Um, can you all see? Great. This I'm going to have to mess with the form, the size of this. Let me know if your screen can still see that. Looks good. Cool. All right, so um, <clears throat> anybody, I'm going to post this into the chat here. If you go ahead and click on the um, gap.karma for pocket, this is going to show you um, we did a scrape of all of the current grants that were in our forum. I'm sure we've missed some, so if you're not in here, please let me know. Um, but these are the old ones, um, as well as some people that are currently active. And you can see like who they've been assigned to and then what the socket is for. Everybody here that has given us an ETH address, um, you can log in with your ETH address at the top right here and claim your grant. If for some reason your grant is not assigned to you, it just means that when, back when we were doing pocket related, um, sorry, pocket wallets, um, there's no way to do it. We need you to have an ETH compatible address. But you should be able to log in and get your um, grant, and then we can start doing updates here. So for this month, there's some basic questions around impact that we're gonna be answering. Um, let me see if I can open up my projects here. Cool, so I made a test project and so on the back end, it should be pretty easy. You're gonna have a test project with some basic info here, and you can go in and edit that project to be in line with what you've put into the forum. So you got a description, your name, some socials, which you're welcome to skip. Um, we're not trying to, to dox anybody, and then the team members that do it. Oh my God, you guys are gonna see everything. There is a small fee, which will go away next month. It's less than a dollar. Um, if that's bothering you, let me know, and I'm happy to send you some wrap pocket to cover that. And then once you get into the grant, you should be able to, or sorry, once you've created your team, you should be able to open up multiple grants. And so you can think about it two ways. Um, you know, something like Nodis is a team with many team members. Someone like Harry is a person who will have Harry's grants within that. Um, and you can get multiple grants. And this is gonna be anything from a quick grant to an RFP um, to even a bounty, I think would be helpful to have in here. Um, but for now, we're just doing anybody who's getting a quick grant. And again, I'm not gonna walk through the whole thing. You're just gonna add your grant, put your basic info in here in descriptions. And then <clears throat> what I'm looking for is milestones. So you get a grant update each month and you can add milestones. For the quick grant options, we're just gonna put you know February, I guess March 1st. Hey, this is the milestone, the report for this month. And you can put your information in here. I think we should be able to have an impact evaluation on here afterwards. Let me just, uh, yeah, here it is. So our impact evaluation is like, what are we doing in here? How are we measuring it? You guys can fill these in. These are templates. So again, fill them in if they don't make sense, let me know. Um, we can change them with the next month's impact grants. And then once you've created the grant, let me see if I can create it here. Uh, it doesn't have enough info. The point is once you create your grant, you can report on it, um, your impact monthly. And so each month you're gonna be able to say, hey, report on update. And it's gonna give you the option to say, for this month I did these things, I answered these five questions. I think I can pull up a, another person's project here. Yeah, so here it is. It's the impact criteria. So in your impact criteria, I apologize. Can you guys hear my phone ringing? It's distracting. Here, yes. I was just wondering what that was. That's my phone. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and I can't turn it off. So the point being, there's, there's going to be your impact criteria, and you're going to be able to give an update on your impact here. It should actually be really easy once you go in and log into your open grant. You're gonna have five questions that you answer um, and then you'll just submit it and you won't need to go to the forum each month. So I think this month we'll probably have a mix of people that do go to the forum and report and a mix of people that don't, but 
Um, bonus points for anybody who does your report in Karma. And then in Discord, I'm going to have everybody just give me like, a, hey, how was the process? Is this something we should keep using going forward? Um, so I'm really just looking as an experiment. Anybody who has an open quick grant would be really helpful for you to do that. Um, and I'll do a session. I'm sorry, I have a write-up going out tomorrow. And then I'll be open to do a session next week. If anybody has any questions, you can always DM me on it. Okay. And then just the usual piece on current quick grants that are open. Um, there was a conversation in the Poctopus Den about losing DevRel, which uh, I think I can open up here as well. But uh, we did have one shutdown mid-month, which was um, Derek, who had been doing some DevRel-related work, creating tutorials. And obviously, um, Patrick Skinner had left last month, going over to Arwe full-time. Um, but these are the current grants that we have, ones that are open. Uh, and again, these will be the ones that will be reporting on each other with, with um, next month's ZK reviews. And so I guess I can open the floor uh, for a little bit here to talk about DevRel. I don't know if anybody needs framing of it, but essentially the, the thing that was brought up was um, how come we're, we're not hiring DevRel and um, how come we're losing DevRel within the community here? So Patrick and Derek being the two people that we're talking about. Now I wanna start by saying one, like having Shane here is actually a really nice stopgap for this DevRel opportunity. I don't think we could have been, I don't think we could have asked for a better person to come in and start doing this work. Um, Shane's been in the community for a really long time. Everybody knows him. He's been super responsive and done such a great job, uh, even in the last like two weeks that he's been here. So um, as far as DevRel goes, I don't think we're like completely out to sea. I think Shane has done an awesome job. Um, but there is the question of how come we don't have any DevRel or official DevRel within the community right now? And I just want to comment a little bit on both Derek and Patrick, which is they were looking for full-time opportunities and they had said that when they came in. So I almost think about it as they had come in saying like, we're looking for full-time work. The foundation was like, okay, well, we, we don't work like that, right? Like we can't hire a full-time person out of the blue and especially not somebody that we haven't worked with before. And so the idea was, can they show some, um, show some impact through either quick grants or RFPs, and then we could open the conversation, kind of like we did with Shane, to would they be a good DevRel fit for the community? Um, and that would mean either bringing them into the foundation or just giving them enough quick grants that they could create a, uh, you know, a living off of that. Um, I think we've also touched a couple of times on the technical leadership role that we need at the foundation. And so I'll just speak really frankly right now, which is we are well aware that we need more technical expertise within the foundation. Shane's been an awesome step forward towards that. Um, Mateo came in. Mateo did a lot of great work, um, but ultimately was put in a position where they were doing two different things that were really hard to do as one person, which is like working with the protocol team and doing a DevRel-like um, responsibility, as well as being like a strategic leader for the foundation. And so we've come to the conclusion that we did need to split those two roles. But I think the biggest piece here is we really want to make sure that we have this strategic technical leader on the foundation who can say like, okay, yes, we're going to get to Shannon, but what happens after that? What are we doing in the next six months, 12 months? What's going on in the other ecosystems looking at, you know, Cosmos and Celestia um, and even in places that we not, may not even be looking yet to figure out like what is the trajectory of Pocket um, you know, Ramiro, I want to call out as well. You've done an awesome job of stepping up with some of the AI work. You just opened a quick grant. Um, I think we realize very much so, especially with if you're following any of the NVIDIA stuff, like this is such a um, such an explosion going on right now and over the last six months that there's a lot of opportunity in that as well. So um, what we're thinking right now is we really do need to get a technical strategic leader in whether that's pulling from the community or someone separate. And that's the, the link that I posted yesterday in um, Jinx's ecosystem call. You know, we really do need somebody in there before we can pull in DevRel. There's a lot of things that can be done and there's a lot of ways we can spend money and time that are not gonna be uh, useful uses of money and time because there is so much going on. And so until we have that figured out, I think we're in this little bit of a stopgap here, which is bringing on people like Shane and Ramiro and others from the community who can fill some of these roles 
before we say like, okay, it's time to bring on a full-time DevRel. I've talked a whole bunch and I just want to like take a pause here and open the floor to get other people's thoughts or questions. So one thing I want to add on the kind of the DevRel stuff is uh, we are in, in, in a interesting time where uh, where with 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 both of these current sockets, there really wasn't a good uh, a really good fit just because we're in the middle of Morse to Shannon. Um, one thing we don't want to do with sockets is be putting a lot of time and energy into sockets that are only going to be more specific or only affect Morse. Um, we want to be forward thinking. So we want sockets that are uh, going to be able to transition right into Shannon or are actually making, uh, making, um, you know, uh, results or, or making things, uh, you know, documentation or tutorials or something like that, uh, that will not just be for potentially a few weeks or a month or something like that, but be for, uh, translate into Shannon. So, uh, you know, like an example is like the uh, uh, node tooling. If we create a lot of node tooling right now and have sockets creating node tooling right now for Morse, that would really not translate into Shannon. So those would kind of be a sunk cost that uh, probably once it was finished and then once it was uh, um, really uh, able to kind of uh, spread to be useful to folks, um, you know, Shannon will have a completely different node uh, node system. So it, it, we are in a little bit of an interesting spot where once we get to a place with Shannon, uh, which looks to be very soon, March is really our kind of start date uh, in March. Um, once we get to that point, uh, we could actually start having folks really trying a whole bunch of new things uh, on Shannon in terms of making tooling or, or, or making, uh, 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 well, tooling on the node side, tooling on gateway side, tooling on, uh, you know, analytics side, what have you. Um, there's just a lot of opportunity there. And all of that work would more or less be able to translate into something that uh, lasts. So that's just one of the, one of the things kind of going on right now with how we want to evaluate sockets and how we want to evaluate uh, contributions is we want to make sure that resources are going to things that will uh, go beyond Morse. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so the the tricky part of being in between the two right now is like it's just a hard time to like direct that effort in a way that's going to be long-term meaningful. So yeah, that's really great context. Thank you, Shane. I mean, I can keep talking. I'm really good at this part. So um, the I guess the last piece of this is just calling out that it's not falling on deaf ears. Like we really know that we need more DevRel and more, um, more people in the community doing that kind of work. And the two pieces of this are smart funds and having direction for those people. So that way we're not just, you know, uh, throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. So that's the biggest piece. Um, if people have great DevRel who are willing to do like part-time free, you know, freelance work right now, please bring them in. You know, any type of grant would be a great opportunity for them to get involved in the community and learn things. You know, Thresh, I really appreciate that you've jumped in and opened some grants. I think it's a great opportunity um, for us to have somebody like you come in and start contributing. And then as Shannon, you know, kicks off, you'll be able to quickly transition to the content that we need there. But it's just one of those hard things. Like DevRel is a... Um, high skill, like well-paid job. And many people that we've seen come into our ecosystem are looking for full-time work. And um, we currently just don't have a lot of full-time opportunities. We do have a lot of piecemeal stuff or a lot of, you know, contract a company to do that work. But if you are, and, and I will call out US-based, um, which both of, well, I don't know if Patrick was, but being US-based and health insurance and those other pieces, that's just a non-negotiable for some people. And um, so sometimes having things like grants are a good transition, but they're never going to be a long-term solution for the people that have families or need health care. So another quirk of being part of the American system. All right, I'm going to pause for a minute here in case anybody else has any thoughts, questions. And then um, Shane, if you want to pull up your, your slides, feel free to get ready. You're up next.
Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Let me uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, great preview. Um, actually, okay. Let me go to the right slide. Oh, am I missing a slide? One second. I thought I had a uh, had a slide on Shannon. Uh, okay. Well, I'll just wing it. Uh, I had a slide on Shannon that I might have uh, might have copied over. So no worries. All right. Uh, sharing my string uh, screen now. Okay, are folks able to see it? Perfect. Okay. Uh, bring it up. Okay. All right, folks. Thank you. All right. So, testnet update. Uh, like I said, I had a uh, I had a slide. I think I copied it over. So I'll just uh, shoot from memory. Um, yeah, so uh, testnet is uh, progress is being made uh, right now. There is uh, our delay right now is uh, rollkit, which is kind of a middle layer between uh, what Shannon is on the Cosmos SDK and what uh, Celestia is, which is where we want to uh, have our validation. Rollkit is this middle layer, and right now there we're, we're having an issue with it. Um, we are, I should say, challenges. We've been having challenges with it. Uh, the great news is, is we've been talking with the team. They've been super responsive. So uh, things are moving forward, uh, but we aren't able to launch mainnet as uh, soon as we are wanting. Uh, the good news is uh, we have completed, uh, at least we, we have finished the migration uh, from going from Cosmos SDK uh, 0 0.47 to uh, 0.50. And that migration changed a lot of how modules work within the Cosmos SDK. So uh, it was it was it was a big uh, it was going to be a big change from going from that one to the new one. So uh, the team has uh, essentially got all the code ready. They're now doing reviews and things of that nature. But uh, the goal this week was to uh, start doing final reviews of the code and, and we're at that point. So, uh, you know, we can't give an exact date on when the testnet will be exactly launched. It could be as soon as, you know, uh, as soon as tomorrow, if we're able to uh, get everything running with Rollkit, but it could be something else. Uh, it could be later on down the road. We are gonna be, uh, there's gonna be a lot of folks at ETH uh, Denver, including myself. So uh, yeah. But the whole goal is to at least get the migration completed um, before ETH Denver, uh, so it doesn't uh, uh, slow down work at all. Um, because of the migration and uh, uh, between the migration and uh, working with Rollkit, uh, we have extended the iteration, the current iteration we're on. Normally iterations go for two weeks, uh, but we extended it for another two weeks uh, because obviously this was a, a big transition that needed to be addressed. Um, so if you look in GitHub, uh, everything's up to date, uh, but uh, this current iteration was extended by two weeks just so we can tackle everything and do everything in a really methodical way so that we're not rushing this migration, we're not rushing, uh, you know, everything with Rollkit, and we're, you know, operating at a good pace. So that's kind of the update on Testnet. Um, any thoughts or questions? All right. So I am going to progress then. Uh, yeah, feel free to um, interrupt me at any point or raise your hand. Uh, once I get going and I'm looking at these slides, I have a hard time uh, also keeping up with chat. So definitely feel free to, uh, Zach, feel free to uh, interject uh, when, you, when you see relevant things to mention. Um, but yeah, I'll just kind of get going. 
All right, so I wanted to do a deep dive into uh, I wanted to do a deep dive into Shannon tokenomic theories. Uh, this is not stuff that has been fully flushed out. This is kind of where we're at and where our mind is. But kind of the idea is we can start communicating uh, what tokenomics might look like in Shannon and some mechanisms that we're creating, and then uh, and then from there we're able to get community feedback. We're able to get uh, contributions, hopefully, uh, because there's a lot of there's a lot of elements that go into tokenomics, and you know you can't expect one person or one team to really be able to see everything from every angle. So the idea is just to kind of get some of this understanding out there, have people munching on it, get some questions going. Um, but all this is very early uh, in terms of what we're sharing. Uh, so kind of a deeper, um, you know, more collected presentation uh, or write up will be coming on down the road. But right now is just to start a conversation, if you will. Um, so before we talk about what we want to do with Shannon, it's just important to understand where we are with Morse today. So I uh, kind of created this this graph or, or this table that is going to be expanding, and I'm uh, going to go through it kind of step by step. So today, you know, we have around 400 million relays. Um, and then when you look at the tokenomics of our burn to mint ratio, for every one pocket that is burned by gateways, uh, 135 pocket is minted for nodes. Uh, and so inflation uh, is, is, you know, uh, that's what creates pockets inflation. Now, the network inflation is around 100, uh, or is around 5%, sorry, uh, is around 5% uh, network annual inflation. Um, but in a realistic term, when we look at the economics between gateways and nodes, you can see it as one burn equals 135 pocket minted. Um, now the problem with this is, with this kind of uh, with this kind of inflation of of burn to nodes uh, or burn to mint, if a gateway had its own nodes, it could actually start sending burn. Uh, it could burn one pocket with to send. You know, let's say one pocket is uh, you know a, a thousand relays. It could burn one uh, one pocket to send a thousand relays to their own nodes. Um, this would be in a completely, you know, permissionless uh, environment for gateways. Um, that would create what we call and what we've always called in pocket self-dealing, where a gateway is able to see, oh, hey, I've got a session with my node in it. So I'm going to send all my relays to my node and just enjoy that uh, 1,000 uh, or 13,000% 13, uh, return on my burn, right? Burn one, get 135. Uh, so you obviously can't have that kind of economic model with inside a pocket because uh, it would, you know, it would create targeted attacks and it would completely ruin the uh, economics of pocket. So, um, so how do you deal with, you know, possible gaming inside of Morse? Well, that's why gateways are not permissionless. Um, PNF currently safeguards from self-dealing by requiring gateways to sign contracts with them uh, in a very legal sense so that there's protection against any kind of self-dealing. So these kind of contracts are signed with uh, Grove, they're signed with Nodies, they've been, they're uh, being signed or have signed with Liqu uh, Liquify, they were announced uh, recently. I don't know exactly where they're, uh, where everything is with every gateway, but that's what the process is right now. PNF is what uh, allows there to be this burn to mint ratio without the gaming. But with PNF being involved, you can't have permissionless gateways. Um, and if they do deal with permission, if they do any kind of self dealing, uh, they're legally liable for it. So, you know, it creates a big, uh, uh, you know, so there's a decent incentive to not do it. Um, all gateways are also uh, fully doxed with PNF. So, that's kind of the system that has to be. Uh, but with uh, uh, stakers, though, uh, stakers enjoy a 9% inflation because they're uh, or 9% APY. So because you're able to, you know, pocket is able to burn one pocket, but still mint uh, 135 pocket, it creates, you know, a staking APY. And this staking APY is why people have locked up pocket 
uh, inside the pocket ecosystem. Uh, if there wasn't any reason or any return on locking up your tokens, why would anyone lock up their tokens? Uh, so uh, if you look at you know pockets staking APY compared to something like Rocket Pool or Avalanche or Celestia, uh, you know we're we're all kind of in that same range. Uh, but what but it's important that there is a staking economy within Pocket so that tokens are locked because that's very beneficial for um, for nodes. Uh, but then remember what I just talked about before about the self dealing. Uh, within this system, how is self-dealing mitigated? Well, it's mitigated because PNF uh, uses legal means to ensure that folks aren't able to self-deal. So if you kind of use, look at this graph, this is a snapshot of what Morse is today in terms of its, you know, most bare bone uh, kind of economics, tokenomics uh, screenshot. That's what this is. Now, when we look at Shannon, you know, what would be the ideal tokenomics? Because first you start with what the ideal uh, environment looks like, uh, kind of what your what your goal is. So I've created this now as a goal of where we want to get uh, Shannon tokenomics. So in order to do this, you have to do one kind of main major change between uh, Morse today and now. And a big factor is increasing the relays from 400 million a day to 25 billion. So if we had a lot more relays on the network, this is what Shannon could ultimately look like. You could have a burn ratio, that's one to one. One, uh, one pocket is burned, one pocket is minted. You can have permissionless gateways. You can have obviously permissionless nodes as it is today. Uh, staking APY could be around 7%, which is right on track with other networks. Uh, and self-dealing, is addressed on both chains. Uh, and the self-dealing is addressed on-chain. It's not going through PNF or anything like that. Uh, Everything is completely on-chain. So this is where we would love to be to, uh, to be able to launch Shannon uh, and have this tokenomics model uh, available. Now, there's more mechanisms and more things that you can kind of add onto this basic model uh, where you know maybe compute units are kind of a part of this uh, burn to mint ratio, right? But ultimately, keeping things simple, this is what uh, we're ultimately heading for. But the ideal tokenomics can't be achieved yet. And that's because relays are not, uh, aren't in an environment where we could actually have this kind of model. So without relays being in this kind of, uh, being somewhere around 25 billion per day, uh, what that tokenomics model would actually look like if we were to apply it to Shannon, uh, at launch is everything would look great except for the staking APY. Staking APY would be less than 1%, uh, less than, you know, uh, we're literally talking 0.08%. That is, uh, that would be a huge, huge uh, transition from Morse to Shannon because now everyone's rewards is significantly reduced uh, to the point where is it even really worth it? Uh, is it even worth having servicers on the network if there's no actual tokenomics to incentivize uh, them to be on the network in the first place? So uh, yeah, it 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 would uh, it would kill pocket staking ecosystem. So we can't do that. Even though we would love to have this model, we can't do that. It can't be applied today because we're just not mature enough yet as a full ecosystem to be able to flip the switch and make it possible. Uh, so really, since we know that the ideal stand and tokenomics are possible, what uh, what is possible and what should our goals be for right now for going into Shannon? Uh, number one, permissionless gateways and nodes. Uh, this will allow Pocket's uh, demand side to grow without relying on legal contracts. Then any gateway can just stake Pocket and start using Pocket for relays without having to go through PNF and go through this whole process, which is very burdensome uh, and very much off chain uh, in order to become a gateway. Um, but the flip side of this is like the more people that are able to join in an uh, easy fashion allows the network to uh, get more relays because more people are grow or more people are joining. So that's increasing relays. So by growing the demand, it would allow us to eventually transition into the economic model we want of one to one in a burn mint ratio. 
Um, number two is enough state uh, enough staking APY. We don't want to crush our staking ecosystem, so we need to have enough staking APY that it keeps people incentivized to have their tokens locked and participate in the network. Uh, and then number three is we have to deal with the uh, we have to address self dealing. Self dealing is because when one or and two are both a goal and you don't have enough relays to address it self-dealing becomes a problem, which is what we were talking about before. Um, so in order for you to have number one and two in an economic model, you have to address three. So this is where uh, I'm gonna kind of explain how all three of these uh, goals, currently the challenge currently with making all three of these goals work uh, together. So if you look at this as like a trilemma, you've got, Staking APY, which you want to keep uh, good enough to incentivize people to participate in the network. You want permission of the gateway so people can just join, they can bring the relays, and we can see demand side grow without needing to go through legal contracts. Uh, and you also don't want uh, self dealing to happen in the first place. So if, uh, if we were to enable permissionless gateways uh, and in a way that addresses self dealing, our staking APY would be crushed um oh i just i just noticed am i breaking up for folks or am i okay i can hear you okay yeah you're good for okay me. okay great um so if we were to enable permissionless gateways and address self-dealing it would kill the staking apy which is what we were talking about before uh with the most ideal economic model for shannon um but if we were to instead, okay, well, let's have permissionless gateways and have good staking APY, well, then we have, uh, we aren't addressing self-dealing because now self-dealing would be able to happen uh, because the mint to burn ratio is off, uh, is off balance uh, in terms of it's not one-to-one -one, and a permissionless gateway could just send all their relays to themselves to create an insane uh, return on their burn. So, you, you have to address self-dealing uh, as well. Um, or you can go to where we are with Morse today, where we have the staking APY and we've addressed self-dealing through, uh, through PNF, but that means we can't have permissionless gateways. So this is the challenge that we're constantly dealing with, with uh, transitioning from Morse to Shannon. How do we address all these simultaneously? Well, there, we believe there is a solution and this is what we're looking into. And I'm gonna just kind of touch on what that solution looks like and how it actually can address all three of these issues simultaneously to allow us to transition from Morse to Shannon without needing you know, 25 billion relays a day. So uh, what this would achieve is this would, uh, you know, it would achieve basically decent balance within pocket where you have 40, uh, 400 million relays a day. The burn to mint ratio is still uh, high, but that's because we want the high staking APY. Um, but we want, uh, but with what I'm going to be sharing, we can still have permissionless uh, gateways and nodes, uh, and self dealing is able to be addressed. But it's able to be addressed on chain via useful QoS, is what I'm calling it. Uh, hold, 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 hold on for the questions for just a moment. Um, but uh, if I look at the bottom, uh, quickly reading the bottom, you know, with today's relays, a one-to-one -one burn ratio would kill Pocket's uh, staking ecosystem. Oh, oh, wait, that, sorry, that was from a, uh, uh, that was carried on from a different slide. Anyways, so the self-dealing mitigation uh, is able to be done on-chain through useful QoS. Now, full disclosure, there's a pretty epic battle going on right now. Gonna be a pretty epic debate in ETH Denver. I or I coined this uh, useful QoS. Oshansky believes it should be called implicit QoS, and uh, because he actually believes that useful QoS could be used uh, later on down the road with another mechanism. So there's still going to be a debate, uh, and it's going to probably get pretty pretty nasty. I'm, I'm I'm thinking of something of a cage fight going on in East Denver. So uh, tickets pending. I've been so, training. I'm yes. ready for this. All right. Bring it on. Oh, we're gonna record. We're gonna record this and tweet it on, uh, and get Pocket News to basically give us a play-by-play. -play. 
Oh man, uh, I I'm very very underprepared. I, I'm I'm having a hard time just packing for it. Uh, eat Denver now. I got to train for a cage fight too. It's, oh man, brutal. Oh, uh, so for the purposes of this, I'm gonna say useful QoS. All right, but name is pending. Uh, we'll 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 see what comes out of Eat Denver. So with useful QoS, uh, you can kind of uh, useful QoS distributes rewards to all nodes in a session. While jail, uh, while jailing useless nodes. Um, so instead of a session where you have nodes that are serving different amounts of relays and they get paid for each relay that they serve, node each session is kind of seen as a group where that whole group, every node in that session, will all get equal rewards. Therefore, there is no benefit to targeting your own nodes with more work because more work doesn't necessarily translate into more rewards. Uh, this is actually how the whole concept of really Shannon's original economics uh, was designed way back in 2021, was the idea of you use fishermen uh, in order to rate nodes and find out which nodes are good and which nodes are bad, so that when you do this distributed reward, you're not paying for terrible nodes. Uh, so this concept has been around in pocket uh, really since the idea of V1 originally came. So uh, so there's nothing new here where we're using an, a, a similar model that has already been widely discussed and talked about. Um, but that eliminates the ability to send relays to your own node and create an economic advantage with it. Uh, because regardless if you do it, all the rewards are going to be spread out to all those nodes. So you don't uh so your node works more than anyone else's node, but everyone all gets paid the same. So it actually doesn't make sense to attack your node in that way. Um and what and so what Q uh what useful QoS will do uh is kind of the flip side of this is if you're distributing rewards to to nodes in the uh, original kind of Shannon version, you would have Watchmen, which are still expected to come later on down the road with Shannon, uh, just not at launch. Um, but Watchmen would ensure that nodes are at least quality so that you don't have people creating fake nodes uh, and just putting them into sessions. And then, uh, you know, basically filling nodes, filling sessions with fake nodes so they can get more and more rewards for not actually doing any work. So you have to be able to kick out and not reward people that are not actually doing some kind of useful work. So that's where useful QoS will jail nodes that are constantly being avoided by gateways. Um, if a node is constantly getting low relays in multiple sessions across multiple gateways, then it's considered useless. Right now, Grove has its own QoS. It's looking for nodes that can properly serve its traffic. So it's testing all the nodes in a session. If a node is not meeting their quality uh, standards, they don't send relays to that node. So that node won't get it. That node is being avoided. If, say, that node that's being avoided by Grove goes into another session and is avoided as well and not sent relays, you can start to see a pattern naturally developing on chain because gateways are incentivized to send nodes or send relays to quality nodes, uh, which will naturally kind of create, and this is why Daniel uh, uh, likes the name implicit, because you're, you're, you're in kind of an implicit fa fashion, you're able to find out who is actually providing real quality uh, to gateways the, uh, based on how gateways are actually using the node. So, uh, so QoS is not about judging the quality of the node. Uh, it's about the usefulness of the node. And you, def you define usefulness by how much it's being used by apps and gateways on the network. So what does this look like? Okay, so uh, nodes that are constantly performing uh, in what I'm going to call the low bucket get jailed after multiple sessions. So here at the top, you see there's session one, two, and three. And each of these sessions, you know, are from a different gateway. Uh, and so you have node one, two, three, four, and they're all serving a certain amount of relays. Now you see node four is at the bottom of the bucket because it only served 10 relays. If it's only serving 10 relays, that means that Grove is only sending it a QoS check and then realizing, oh, 
there's it's not responding to my node, so I'm not going to or it's not responding to uh, my request properly, so I'm not even going to send it any more traffic. So those are QoS uh, relays, um, and you know within within the network, there's always going to be a base layer that even completely dead nodes will still receive a few relays. So in this case, you see it only received ten relays, while everyone else is uh, receiving uh, tens of thousands. Obviously, that's a bad node. Uh, at least that's what Sesh Gateway 1 is saying. However, when that node goes to Gateway 2, if it's showing the same result, well, that's starting to build a pretty good case that node 2 isn't actually connected to anything useful and providing any service. Well, then once you get to session 3, it's like, okay, how many times do we need to see this node is not performing uh, before we just go ahead and jail it? So in this system, nodes that are objectively bad get uh get jail because no one wants to work with them no gateways no apps no one's wanting to work with them at least in some kind of uh consistent manner uh which we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh what those parameters might look like um but we can deem uh that node 4 is useless since it is void by all gateways um and because of because it's avoided by all these gateways uh it doesn't receive rewards when it's jailed so uh if you were if you delay rewards from a session so say you uh session one here you actually delay the rewards for six sessions well this node is actually jailed in session three so by the time session six comes around uh like six sessions have passed any jail nodes would not get any rewards from that original uh session one and so you can by delaying rewards to basically see hmm is this node going to be accepted by other gateways then you're able to uh jail the node and it not be a part of the distribution of rewards so let's look at this uh in a different way where it's not a objectively bad node and instead it is useful uh and it gets uh, you know, and it's useful within a number of sessions. So on session one, it's still in the bottom bucket, okay? It's still uh, only doing, you know, 70K. Even though that's a lot, it's still technically in the bottom bucket. However, in uh, session two, it is no longer in the bottom bucket. So now it's no longer building that consistent track record of always being in the bottom bucket. And now we have session three, where it's even actually improved more because maybe that gateways QoS utilizes uh, the setup of that node even more than maybe the other two. So, uh, and so you can see that a node in most, in most circumstances would be placing in different areas, uh, especially since this is going across different sessions, different gateways, it would be ranking different. And you only penalize those in the very bottom bucket uh, in this kind of scenario. So node four is able to still keep operating, even if it gets in the bottom bucket of a session, that's no big deal. It's just if it stays there across multiple gateways and multiple sessions, that's when it would have an issue. And if that's the case, if it's getting jailed uh, because it's constantly in the low bucket, they need to do something to not be in that low bucket anymore because they need to find a way to allow the gateways to consider them useful. Maybe it's the location of where they're at, and that's just not where uh, uh, lots of traffic is. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe they they uh, they're not using enough uh, performance in their uh, uh, in their cloud setup to where they can uh, handle the amount of relays that gateways are giving them. It there's all sorts of things that could go wrong, but um, if someone is consistently in the bad bucket. Uh, then they need to obviously change something in order to be able to compete with all the other nodes. But most nodes are going to be bouncing around all over the place uh, in terms of their positions in buckets. So uh, the results is then you have res you have rewards that go to only useful nodes. Uh, jailed nodes do not receive rewards in useful QoS since rewards are delayed. Um, and what that does is that prevents folks from creating node stakes with act without actually running nodes. Uh, like right now, Grove, uh, a lot of their in a lot of their sessions, a lot of those nodes don't even have they're not even running. They're just stakes, like node stakes that are just on the chain. But maybe the person shut down their node. Maybe it became too expensive, so they just shut down their node and they didn't bother with going through the unstaking process. 
Um, so there's a lot of chain or a lot of nodes on the chain right now that are uh, that are essentially dead nodes. But uh, and with this model, they would be completely taken out right from the get go. Oshansky, go for it. Uh, thanks, Shane. Uh, I sorry to interject, but I just kind of wanted to jump in and uh, make sure everyone listening, either live or in the future, is on the same page. But like, is it fair to say that what you're presenting now is kind of what your thinking is, what your research is from your experience, uh, from being years in the pocket ecosystem, and kind of thinking about it? But none of this is kind of set in stone. None of this is decisive, and this is more to just kind of share your research ideas to get everyone in the ecosystem thinking, or is this more of a, this is what we're moving forward with? Uh, well, this I is, kind of this want is to make all sure theories. everyone has context. Yep, theories. This is theories. So really yeah. the, the, the trilemma is the problem, right? So if folks have another way of addressing the trilemma, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, folks can uh, contribute in all sorts of ways. Um, so it's because- So it's kind of like, sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it, it is, uh, this is currently what uh, I've, I've been doing, I've been working out this kind of what useful QoS is, uh, and I've been sharing it with, you know, Olshansky, I've been sharing it with a lot of people, and so we're starting to get more eyes on it. And because we're starting to get more eyes on it, that's why I wanted to go ahead and present it, start getting more minds on it, uh, as we flush this out and think through, is this the kind of solution that can address the uh, trilemma that we're dealing with? Yeah. And I think it's also important to call it like, this is an open conversation, right? Whether you're a node runner or a community member uh, or anything, like if you have better ideas on how to do this, uh, you know, present it to the community, discuss it online, offline, whatever we decide to do from a tokenomic perspective, will still definitely go through a formal uh, DAO proposal on the forum. Uh, so there's going to be many discussions to come. Uh, but I do want to call out personally, like, I really like where this idea is going. It's also worth calling out Chain. Uh, you know, when we added gateways on Chain, this is from a conversation I had with Chain many years ago. But for anyone on the call, uh, Chain, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is still an open conversation, literally up for grabs with any ideas that anyone has. Is, is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That, uh, like, awesome. we've, uh, as, yeah, as Oshayanski mentioned, we've literally been talking about this for years. Um, uh, I mean, uh, Infocon uh, in Dominican Republic. I mean, we were literally walking, walking on the beach, Oshansky and I talking about, <laughs> talking about <laughs> permissionless gateways and, and how you, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and the challenges of watchers or how watchers could, could be, uh, uh, you know, used. Um, so yeah, there's a rich history, uh, well beyond just Oshansky. I mean, uh, talking with Andrew, talking with oh, so many people all over the place about this. And very similar to the release that we were doing a couple of days ago where little clothing was being worn, same thing happened on the beach in the Dominican Republic. So <laughs> there's there there is a pattern. I'll 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 never forget I'll never forget those those conversations, Oshansky. Uh so anyways, um yeah, so all of this is just kind of theories, uh which is why I, you know, called it theories. Um and if folks have other ways, you really most of my slides are about painting the issue because that's the issue we have. And with this being a builder's call, the idea is, is let's get the issues out there so that they're clear and, and, and people are able to understand them. And then we can come up with the best solutions uh, for, those, for those problems. I've been thinking about it. And so I'm putting out a theory that people can poke holes in, that people can uh, take and run with. Uh, but ultimately the, the goal is to have the most successful you know, Shannon launch ever. And to do that, we've got to have good tokenomics. Um, and with mainnet kind of coming up, uh, this is the perfect time to really start having uh, open conversations about what tokenomics might look like. All right. Uh, so uh, kind of the last point on this slide is what at least in my mind with this uh, useful QoS is it would uh, it would actually increase the usefulness uh, of sessions. So as nodes are eliminated because they're, they're either not useful because they're not configured right, uh, or they're completely dead nodes, it doesn't matter. Uh, as more nodes are taking, taken out, 
uh, because they're showing a consistent track record of being low quality, um, the usefulness uh, of the nodes in a session actually increases. So it would be with something like Grove, when they get a session, it's mostly high quality nodes, if not all the time, high quality nodes. If there's objectively bad nodes, they'll be weeded out quickly across all the uh, different gateways or apps. Um, but uh, but for the most part, they're going to have really high quality nodes. So it actually creates even more quality assurance across the whole network uh, because you're looking at, hey, is a node actually being used? And you're deciding, um, should it be participating in rewards or should it be jailed until it's able to be at a level that makes it uh, competitive in the node market? Right. And then, uh, so again, because this is all uh, uh, research and this is all theories, you know, there's still a lot, uh, a lot more research to, uh, a lot more research is still underway. Um, you know, some of the challenges of this one and, and what we need to figure out in this, in this theory is you have to figure out, you know, like how many nodes should be in a session, what creates a good, you know, uh, spread of nodes in a session, and then what should those buckets um, you know, what should the bottom bucket be? Should it be just the, you know, bottom 10%? Should it be the bottom 1%? Like what, what exactly should the bottom bucket be? Uh, that all would need to be, you know, mapped out and figured out. Um, you know, the number of uh, app stakes uh, to create good session spread. So if you have, you know, is it better to have less apps per se and, and bigger sessions? Or is it better to have smaller sessions and more apps? Like those are, Another area that we need to kind of think through, um, geo zoning is going to be important because if you get in a session where the traffic is coming from Asia and you're in the U.S., how do we account for that? Like you're 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 not being penalized because of your quality per se. You're just being penalized because there's a long distance. So we need to be able to uh, you know ensure that that's being addressed. Um, you know the number of sessions before getting jailed. You know how many times do you have to be in the lower bucket before you get jailed? Um, and then how many sessions should would uh, should uh, rewards be delayed um, to allow a bad node uh, to get um, uh, to essentially get caught out and jailed before it receives any rewards. So those are all just kind of parameters off the top of my mind. The thing that I'm thinking about uh, kind of on a daily basis right now, that that's where my mind's going. Uh, some of the questions and where people can poke holes in them. Uh, is if someone has enough nodes, you know, can they monopolize on small chains? Um, you know, self-dealing could still potentially happen if there's just not enough nodes in a session uh, or not enough nodes on a chain and someone brings a bunch of nodes and just starts spamming relays. Um, if they hold a large amount of each session, they could start to gain tokenomics potentially. Um, but at that point, it would actually be easy for the network to respond to it, though, because if someone starts spamming uh, in a, uh, uh, you know, in a way that's generating reward for them, well, uh, people will then want to transfer their nodes into that, uh, you know, into that session uh, or into that chain to participate in all that spamming. So there's, you know, so there's there's hard uh there, there's soft solutions to some of this but how much of it needs to be like a hard rigid solution versus a soft solution those are the kind of questions that we're thinking through um another one is can gateways target specific nodes uh to jail them like could gateways actually act maliciously and try to you know take out certain node runners um you know we don't really have that kind of ecosystem but uh you know we, we can't expect we can't have this trust with every single node uh, or every single gateway on the ecosystem. So, you know, that's something that's still worth looking into. What what are the scenarios around that? Um, and then the last one is, uh, you know, can lazy node runners create their own app stakes to prevent their nodes from being uh, in a low bucket? So if they kind of create a bunch of small app stakes, uh, can they prevent their node from being in the low bucket because they hold a bunch of app stakes and they're able to, you know, position their node favorably in their own app stakes? So all this needs to be worked out, um, but at least right now with kind of the conversations and the open conversations I've been having, all of these can have some kind of solution to them, uh, but there's you know still gonna always be a challenge um, with making sure that we're seeing everything from every angle.
So a lot more work is going to be done in terms of putting all this together in terms of uh, making this something that's presentable to folks. But uh, at least for now, this is kind of one theory that we're that we're operating with. If there's other theories, now is literally the time to start getting it out there. We need to be able to transition from Morse to Shannon. Uh, we have testnet coming up, so this is the time to start getting any theory out there that uh, is, um, you know, that 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 can be modeled out that has legs. Uh, and you know, really, the best thing that you can do is uh, think about this trilemma. Um, how can you have all of these elements all at play at the same time while uh, achieving our goals? Um, so that's that's kind of Shannon. That's uh, the challenges we're seeing in tokenomics, but that's also kind of where this is where my mind's going. Uh, this is where I've been talking with folks about and a theory that at least is worth considering uh, in the larger ecosystem. So anyways, that's uh, that's basically it. Uh, any thoughts, questions, anything of that nature? Don't be shy, anyone. And a reminder that uh, this has been recorded and we're gonna get this up on uh, YouTube after for those of you that, like me, need to review it one more time to make sure we understand it. Yeah. Uh... Gabby asked, will this conversation be moved to the forum? Actually, maybe we could. We could post this, um, uh, you know, post a uh, a post with this presentation and folks can kind of munch on it and think about it. Um, yeah, no, uh, it, I, it definitely is going to take time for everyone to process things. I'm still processing it. Obviously, this is kind of new uh, in terms of uh, it's a very new theory. We've only been working on it for like two weeks now. Um, but uh, yeah, there's this is the time to be doing it though. Okay, so for geozoning, is it possible uh, or useful to exclude nodes that are in the same uh, geozone as the app state relays? Yeah, that's, you know, one one area that I'm thinking about is still having uh, geozoning as a, a staking, um, uh, it, it's still something that you stake to. So if you stake to a geozone, um, nodes need to stake to that geo zone as well in order to get in sessions uh and then within useful qos the bucket is then only uh only relevant with people that are uh in that geo zone because the session is only made up with people in that geo zone uh if someone is outside of that geo zone then what the app is uh they'll most likely be in the bottom bucket because they're the distance is having to travel much farther than all the other nodes. So they would be in the bottom bucket. Um, so it, it's in the best interest of node runners to uh, to stake in the right region. So I do believe that staking, geo, uh, geo staking is still a very possible thing to include. And that would probably be the most elegant solution um, for, for useful QoS. Right, I see Ramiro's typing. Oh, it, it was only a, a minor comment on the, the shield zones. Uh, I, I agree with what Roshansky says, that the, the, the idea behind this is the best that we have, and it's interest to, to pursue. I, I, I believe that there are lots of things to be discussed before we we can get them get the, all these parameters figured out. But yeah, it's the best thing that we have. So we we are. I I won't be I start 
to doing questions here because it, it will take long and will not, not make sense. But yeah, yeah, I, I like the idea. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I definitely think we're probably going to have a longer discussion at some point once we're able to flesh out this more because, uh, um, again, this is pretty much two weeks I've been working on this and uh, uh, this will, yeah, once once I have more time and especially after ETH Denver, uh, where likely more conversations are going to be happening with folks uh, and, you know, more things will be fleshed out most likely. Probably one of the first things I do when I get back is I'm going to really try to flesh flush this out in a presentable way that then people can start picking apart. Cool. Well, if uh, there's no more immediate questions, uh, I think we're, 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 we're definitely over a little bit. Um, I, 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 I was thinking we might go over just because of the, the, the heaviness of this kind of conversation, but uh, I'm glad I was able to at least get it all out there, get enough uh, information out there for people to, to think about and, and munch on. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll do a a post where folks can, um, uh, you know, at least on the forum have a place to discuss uh, this presentation and uh, this recording, and then you know we can take it from there. All right. Well, thanks everyone. All right. All right, that's a wrap. Have a good one. Thanks, Shane.